Hey everyone, Nathan here, Absurd Being. Okay, Phenomenology of Perception, video 8. We're in part 1, the body, and in this video we'll be looking at the third section, which is the spatiality of one's own body and motricity. So, um, <clears throat> the important thing, the first thing that we're going to look at is, is what Merleau-Ponty calls the body schema. And he starts off introducing this idea by, by thinking about if my arm is resting on the table, I would never think of my arm as being next to the ashtray. In the same way, even if it is, even if it is next to the ashtray, in the same way that the phone, for example, is next to the ashtray. Um, and this is just, it's just the, 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 um, the idea here is that we don't think of our body and our limbs the same way that we think about external objects and again this is just trying to get get us out of that that scientific mode of thinking about the body which is as a thing something as an instrument that we control you know um, and, and this is one way we can understand that is that we don't have this kind of relationship with our bodies we don't see our limbs as things um, external to us as things we don't see our bodies in the same way that we see other objects around us. So I know the position of my limbs. I'm, I'm aware of my body through what Merleau-Ponty calls this body schema. And um, the way that, that science has traditionally understood or initially understood um, the body schema is, and our awareness of our bodies is as, as a summary of bodily experience. Um, which is like, which is called the proprioceptive awareness, and and it, this is acquired over time. So there's a very close link with the associationist model here. This idea that um, we get a, a knowledge or an understanding of the whole of our bodies through kind of piece by piece um, accumulation of data. So it's it's. That that's how we, um, well, that that's how science would explain our sense of our, our bodies, our, our own awareness of ourselves, our proprioceptive awareness. But Malo Ponti says that there's rather than that we have this. He prefers this Gestalt idea again of form, where um, we have this understanding of of our bodies as kind of a whole. Um, as a, there's a global understanding and awareness of ourselves rather than this idea that we are um, <clears throat> piecing together a whole from the parts, from individual moments or from individual um, isolated uh, sensory inputs. Um, so we have this idea that, that we understand our body not not piece by piece. We don't piece together a big picture and get and, and understand um, our, our and come to an awareness of our bodies this way. We're, we're talking or we're preferring to think of it in terms of this gestalt idea of, of having a form, a, a global understanding. But this doesn't explain how this form arises in the first place. So Malo Pondi wants to look at that in a bit of detail. How do we get this, this understanding, this gestalt understanding of our bodies? So the body schema, it's not a copy or a global awareness of body parts, which again is reduces it to this kind of intellectual understanding, something that we are... Um, You know, we're inferring something about the body through a copy we have mentally um, of of our bodies and and where that where where our limbs are. Um, <clears throat> so it's not a copy or a global awareness of body parts. Again, they're isolated individual parts that we're piecing together in our in our heads, so to speak. Rather, the body schema arises in the way. We actively integrate the parts in relation to projects. So the body schema then is dynamic 
has this dynamic aspect. And he says in a nice quote, my body appears to me as a posture toward a certain task, actual or possible. So that's, that's how this body schema arises. It doesn't arise through any kind of intellect, intellectual activity, any, any kind of deduction or, or, or thought processing. It's, it arises for us out of our, um, the projects that we, that we in, engage in in the world. So it's practical right from the start. And that means that this idea of body spatiality or um, the sense of space around our bodies and including our bodies is not a positional spatiality. So it's not um, directed towards where parts of my body are and things in relation to that. It's a situational spatiality. So it, it, it concerns situations. It concerns my projects, my goals, the things I'm, I'm actively doing. That's where we get the sense of, of, our, of a body schema. That's where we, we come to understand um, and have an awareness of our bodies. So I've got a nice quote here. When we use the word here in reference to the body, it does not designate a determinate position in relation to other positions or in relation to external coordinates. It designates the installation of the first coordinates, the anchoring of the active body in an object and the situation of the body confronted with its tasks. So that's quite nice, right? The um, When we're talking about here, as with, with regards to the body, we're not, it's not an objective position. It's not a, it's not, we're not identifying or, or marking out coordinates in relation to other objects. It's not, it's not like a, um, um, we're not locating our bodies in, on a kind of Cartesian graph um, where things kind of objectively fit in certain places and we can, we can map it out. Rather, it's the here of our bodies is the installation of the first coordinates. That's where we start measuring from. And we're not actually going to measure, but, but that's where we take our, we get our bearings from, in a sense. It's where we, where other things make sense in relation to. So it's the establishment of the first place, the original place, the anchoring of our body in an object and in a situation. Um, and another another nice analogy Milo Ponti gives is he says that this this situational spatiality that the here of the body is the darkness of the theater before the movie plays. It's it's the it sets it's it's the scene on which the movie it's it's possible for the movie to to play in the first place, or again the zone of non-being before which beings appear. So it's that it's that. That, that setting up that initial um, prerequisite before anything else can have a place. So the body schema then is not intellectual. That's the big point here. It's practical. It's a manner of expressing that my body is in and toward the world. And so this is, again, this is a very much closely connected with the phenomenal field. And, and it is the phenomenal field. It, it's, a, it's a more detailed description of, of what the phenomenal field is and how it, um, how it works. <clears throat> so the body schema grounds figures, but it also grounds what we think of as objective space. So it's that, it's that, it's that initial, um, again, prerequisite. I keep going back to the same same words. It's that pre prerequisite that we need. It's that setting up of that first original position from which other things get their spatiality. And if you think about it, um, spatial terms themselves on, under, next to, these things are meaningless without some sort of prior orientation. And that's what our body gives us. That's what this this body schema gives us. It, it, it gives us that starting point. 
So there's kind of a double horizon here he mentions, this bodily space and then external space, which, which features in relation to the, these, these um, initial coordinates, this initial, the here of the body. <clears throat> so being dynamic, the bodily schema is best seen through action, best seen through, through an understanding of how we do things, of, of, of doing things and, and acting in the world. So that is where we're going to turn to next with looking, by looking at the case of Schneider and concrete and abstract movement. So Schneider, what is the problem with Schneider? He has a condition called psychic blindness. And basically the idea with this is that he can see objects, um, but he can't recognize what they are. There's nothing wrong with his, um, like his visual processing, but he's, he's unable to identify objects um, even though he can see them. Um, and already, if you think about this, this, this idea of psychic blindness already tells us that there's more to vision than just the reception of sensory inputs. There's something more going on here than just picking up, um, you know, reflected light, light that's reflected off objects. So there's already kind of a, a clue in that, that, that there's more, you know, this, this um, empirical idea of sensory data comes in, gets worked, and then we get an output. That's not enough to cover. It's not enough to explain what, what goes in to vision. But anyway, that's, that's just a little, um, an interesting idea there. So he, Schneider, Schneider has psychic blindness. And another aspect of, of his um, condition is that he's able to perform concrete movements, but not abstract ones. So if it comes to, Milo Pondi gives the example of hammering hammering a nail into with a you know with a hammer obviously um, and he can do that if he's given a hammer and a nail but if he has to imagine if he's, he's asked to pretend that he's hammering then he has to go through the motion he has to pick up pretend he's picking up a, a, a nail and hammering he can't just perform the hammering action um, on its own abstracted from any relevant context so he has to have this this relevant context with it so that that's the difference between concrete action and abstract action concrete movements and abstract movements one one is is performed for real um, with real objects and things and the other is is like imagined um, and he can't do the latter he can't perform abstract movements um, and Malai Ponte also says that uh, when he's he's given his tools, the tools of his trade, I'm not sure exactly what trade he's in, but when he's given the tools of his trade, he can easily use them. He's got no problems with that. Those are the concrete movements. And the reason he can do that is because he doesn't have to, um, he says he doesn't have to look for his fingers. He doesn't have to piece together his fingers and the tools and, and kind of make connections between them. Rather, he says, they are not objects to be found in objective space, but rather powers that are already mobilized by the perception of those tools. They are the center point of the intentional threads that link him to the given objects. And the they, by the way, in that is, is his fingers, Schneider's fingers. So they're not, again, this relation we have with the body, it's not, it's not like another object in the world. My fingers, I don't know my fingers the same way that I know um, my ashtray or my phone. I don't have to look for them. I know where they are. They're, they're, they're a part of me. They're, they're closer, they're more intimate to me than, than any other object. Um, and so... Malai Pondi says, with this in mind, then we don't move our objective body, we move our phenomenal body. We move the body of experience. 
that's what we're that's what we move we don't move this this lump of of flesh and bone and muscle we move our phenomenal body we move something which is is not an object something which can't be considered an object as such um, the tools that schneider uses they are they're they're objects but they they function as poles of action which is which he's directed towards, which he, his his body um, is oriented towards. So he's again in this situation. He's placed in this situation as with projects that um, that allow him to mobilize the body that he is, and in relation to those tools, which function like like I said, like he says as poles of action, which is, a, is kind of a nice way to think about it. And all of this obviously happens non-thetically. So he's, there's no analysis going on here. Nothing's being calculated or planned or um, analyzed in any way. It's, it's all happening, for want of a better word, naturally, instinctively. And another problem with Schneider is that he he's unable to distinguish discern the difference between a touch or, or between being touched on the head and on the body um, he, or he has difficulty discerning between the two but he can scratch a mosquito bite without any problems he can he can if, if he's bitten somewhere he can and, it, and it's itchy he can move towards that immediately he doesn't have to wonder where is the bite the same way that he has to wonder where was I just touched. So there's again there's the and there's that that distinction between having to think about the body in this objective sense as a as an object as an as a thing, and rather and the and this other way of, of thinking about the body as as living in it, as as kind of being one with the, the with one's body. And that, again, Malo Ponti says there's a phenomenal connection here. He doesn't, when, he, when he's scratching a mosquito bite, he doesn't go through the objective world. He's, he's purely in the phenomenal world. He's purely using the phenomenal body, the body of his experience, not the body as, as a thing, a three-dimensional object in, in, um, in, in kind of, in space or in the world like other objects are <clears throat> so this all of this Malo Pondi says shows that we have several holds over our bodies um, and he gives us three there are we're situated in relation to our tasks or our projects that's one hold we have over our bodies another one is we're open to real situations so real actions that call uh, real contexts that call on us to do certain things and we're also open to virtual situations so these are like imagined the imaginary situations where there's no practical signification things where like like um, schneider being asked to just pretend he's hammering a nail and it's that last section <clears throat> or that last that, that that last hold over his body that is schneider's um, deficiency he's he lacks this ability to um, see his body to understand his body in a in a virtual situation removed from any practical um, concrete situation <clears throat> and this tells us then that every movement also has a background there's all this this idea of, of there being a situation every movement takes place within a wider background and this background the situation is not separate from the movement the two are moments of a single whole the the movement and the background the um, the action and the the situation the context whether it's whether it's a real context or an imaginary context, there's always a context. There's always a background, and this gives us the difference then between concrete and abstract movement. 
So the so concrete movement has the given world as a background. It takes place in the real world. Abstract movement has a constructed background, a purely imaginary, virtual background. <clears throat> and it's this that um, Schneider then has lost the ability to create. He no longer has the ability to um, create his own background, his own situation out of nothing. He has to have a real context in which to act. <clears throat> Malai Bondi gives another example here of gesturing to a friend. Um, so if your friend is over there, you, ge you gesture, you know, come over here, um, and they don't notice. So you re-gesture automatically. You, you re-gesture you gesture again. Um, but again, there's no analysis going on here. There's nothing... You're not you're not um, deliberating. You didn't in in order to in order to gesture again to make that same gesture again. You didn't deliberate. You didn't just didn't you know analyze even very quickly. It might be tempting to think ah oh, that analysis is going on just beneath conscious awareness. Um, that's not what's happening. It's it's an immediate, direct, non thetic. Um, gesture. You gesture, they don't notice, you gesture again, perhaps calling this time as well, and and that happens naturally. It's 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 almost the word I'm that I'm I, I'm leaning towards is instinctively. You do it <clears throat> um, out of a sense of being directly engaged in the world and 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 your projects, which which is in this case getting the attention of your friend. So this, this act, so this is a concrete movement. We've got the real world around us, a world, the given world as background. And the movement goes out into the world. Um, and Sartre's description is probably the best one here. It, the movement surpasses the body. It doesn't stop at my fingers with the gesture. The movement extends past my fingers because... I'm not even aware of my fingers. I'm not thinking about my fingers. When I move my hand to make the gesture, I'm not, I'm not consciously moving my body through space uh, with the, uh, the idea that it needs to be so far from my body and I'm not judging, measuring distances. Um, it's all happening. Actually, I've gone off track a little bit. Um, I've gone out into the world, surpassing my body. So I, my thought doesn't stop with my body. My, my thought doesn't even include my body. My body is my thought. And where I'm directed, where I direct my attention is not at my, my, not at my hands, not at my fingers, not at my arm, but at my friend. So Malopondi describes this as centripetal. It's moving out and it's going out into the world. That's where the... Um, that's what this that's what this movement is directed towards it's not a movement of my body it's a movement into the world beyond my body towards my friend and so this takes place within being within the the real world the world um, the given world as opposed to the other situation where we are gesturing doing the same gesture but to no one so we're just pretending to um, gesture to a friend. And this then is an, is an example of abstract movement. And what we do here is establish a zone of reflection. Malai Ponti describes it as. So now we are, the whole movement has, the, the texture of the whole movement has changed. I'm no longer pushing out into, into the world. I'm not directed out towards anything. My, 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 my motions, my movements, all terminate within my bodily space because there's nothing else out there. I'm, I'm only imagining something. Um, so he calls this centrifugal. <clears throat> so it's, it's a, that movement, it's an interior as opposed to that exterior moving out into the world um, of the concrete movement. So this takes place within non-being within an imaginary, reflective situation. <clears throat> so this abstract movement then creates
creates a background still. So there's still a background being created. And he calls this the function of projection. So it's created, this imaginary back, background is created through a function of projection. We project this imaginary situation. But it's still a centrifugal process. It's still internal. It's reflective. I'm not, I'm not going beyond my body. Um, when I gesture to no one, my gesture stops at my fingers because there's no one else out there. Um, the context is imaginary. But it's important to note that the, the concrete movement also has this function of projection included in it. So there is a, um, a, a background, a real background, a, um, what's the word, a, a given world that we're operating within. But that world is never an inert, valueless, or neutral blank slate. It's always imbued with, um, with value for us. And Milo Pondi has a nice expression. He says, our projects polarize the world, causing a thousand signs to appear. So there's still this projection taking place, even in concrete movement. We're never, we're never projecting out towards, um, it's nice, a, a neutral world around us. That everything is, is full of value and has meaning, signification for us. <clears throat> but there's this difference between the abstract and the concrete movements. Okay, so Schneider's disorder then can't be explained by a causal empirical explanation which would then be based on the loss of visual contents. So it would, this would, would involve saying um, something's missing from his, from his vision. He's no longer perceiving certain things. Therefore, um, he's unable to recognize them or he's unable to, um, to perform, to, to act in the way that, that um, an unimpaired person is able to. But the point is, the loss here is deeper than content because he hasn't lost any content. His visual contents have remained the same. Rather, he's lost something else, something deeper. Um, and, and what he's lost, basically, or what, what's happened, what the consequence of, of his, his condition is his motor field has shrunk. He's only now, his field only includes objects that aren't present before him. Sorry, his field, his field no longer includes objects that aren't present before him. It only includes objects that are real, that are actually there. Um, and then he can, he can use them. His body knows what to do with them. Um, <clears throat> so the causal empirical explanation based on a loss of visual contents won't work. That also means that projection, this function of projection, can't be explained by the, the simple presence of contents visual contents. Again, there's something more taking place here. And that's not sufficient to explain this. Also, <clears throat> however, his disorder can't be explained by an intellectualist reflective approach either. Because this would say that Schneider's loss of abstract movement stems from him losing the power of objectification, losing the, the symbolic function, the ability to... to um, create this background, the ability for him to be a subject looking out at an objective world. That would be the intellectualist description, explanation here. But this would then leave him, render him a thing, an object. He wouldn't have a subjective um, experience. There wouldn't be a subjective experience behind it. He would just be reacting to stimulus. To stimuli and and that's not what's happening though <clears throat> so neither of those explanations work now we might be tempted then to think that um, <clears throat> the way we've described concrete movement and abstract movement we might be tempted to think concrete movement is then physiology it's just related to the body it's, it's mechanical and abstract movement is psychological so abstract movement is, is the mind um, 
was purely the mind creating the situation. But Malopanti says that if we give, if we let either of these have complete dominance in one of these spheres, then it's impossible to limit them. It's impossible to shut them out of the other sphere. So if <clears throat> if um, our physiology completely explains concrete movement, if if concrete movement is nothing more than sensory stimulation causing cause and effect causing um, behavior, then there's no way we can stop that from also being true of um, abstract movement. It must be the same. It must just be cause and effect, mental, um, sensory, in, sensory um, input producing behavioral output. It must be mechanical in that sense. <clears throat> and the, the, the other, the opposite holds as well. If we If we say that consciousness is purely responsible for abstract movement, then there's no way to, to say that um, consciousness is, is, is not responsible for concrete movement either. Because if, if, we, if we let one of these um, dominate completely, there's no way to, to then say, oh, but it doesn't apply in this other sphere. If it applies once, it applies over all of our behavior, if it, if it covers, if it describes one aspect of our behavior, it describes all aspects of our behavior. You can't have, we can't be a machine sometimes and a consciousness other times, or a consciousness, a constituting consciousness sometimes, and yet a machine at other times. So, um, <clears throat> so that's not going to work. And Malo-Ponti says, though, the distinction between concrete and abstract movement can only be maintained if there are several ways for the body to be a body and several ways for consciousness to be consciousness. So then the idea, the, the resolution here is that we don't have, we're not either a body or a consciousness. Rather, we can be a consciousness in different ways and we can be a body in different ways. Again, that idea, we have different holds over our body, different ways of holding our body. Um, so it's not a black and white description. And, and this is kind of messy. It's ambiguous, but that's the core of, of Malopondi's philosophy. It is, we are wrapped in ambiguity that, that defines human existence. Um, and rather than, than turning away from that because it's messy, because it's unclear and hazy and fuzzy, we ought to just accept it because that, that is what our phenomenal experience, that's the conclusion that our phenomenal experience um, leads us to. Nevertheless, Malopondi says that intellectualism is less false than it is abstract. So it's, a, it's, it's got the right idea but it's, it's still too abstract. The error, its error, is to make it depend on itself, to make consciousness a standalone, independent entity, a constituting consciousness. It, its mistake is to give it too much dominance. <clears throat> um, the, the idea of the symbolic function, the, the way that, that things are signs for us, and, and, and we create those signs, we give those signs meaning, we, um, we create those uh, situations, the background uh, in which we live. That idea, the symbolic function, gives a deeper explanation that identifies the common structure underneath sensory contents. Um, and belong, in the way that these sensory contents belong to different senses, but they're able to to there's unity underneath them all. This idea of this of this the sensory fun symbolic function, and the way that we we constitute our realities um, works here. It, it's it's fundamental. Like he says, it's not incorrect. It's less incorrect than it is too abstract. Um, so bringing form to the different senses, the different sensory sensory perceptions that we have, 
and organizing them into a coherent whole. <clears throat> so that, that, that there's value in, in intellect, the intellectualist approach, but it's still just too abstract to give us the real, the existential ground that we're looking for here. Um, and and Malopondi says, we don't want to reduce form to content, which is what empiricism does, but we don't want to subsume content under an autonomous form, which is what intellectualism does. And, and in that, in the, the intellectualism, the content then appears as a, as a mere mode of form. So the form is, 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 is still has, has complete dominance. It's the only thing that's important. The, the content itself loses value. So we don't want to go either of those routes. And that's going to bring us to this last section of this video, which is the intentional arc. And here we're going to go back to Schneider and, and look at the, the, the central idea, the central um, restriction of psychic blindness, the central symptom perhaps of psychic, psychic blindness, which is that Schneider can't identify objects even though he can see them. He can only recognize what they are after going through an exhaustive, deductive process, an eliminative process. So if he's given a pen or if he's shown a pen, instead of identifying it immediately as a pen, which is what we would do, he would describe it. Okay, well, it's long, it's thin, it's kind of circular, has a sharp point, um, you know, perhaps it's a pen. That, that's, that's the way he, he will reason out what it is <clears throat> just by looking at it. Same with drawing. When he's drawing an object, he doesn't see the object and grasp it as a whole and then draw it. He's drawing um, parts. He's drawing, he's describing, you know, piece by piece, bit by bit. Okay, so it's got a, a sharp corner over there. I'll draw that sharp corner. So there's no understanding of the whole. There's no, he doesn't have this recognition of the form. All he's doing is, is plucking out contents, um, isolated contents, sen sensory data. Um, like I said, in contrast with, with you or I, for whom the pen would be immediately meaningful, immediately has meaning, has signification. And so Malopondi says here that what's happened for Schneider is the world no longer has a physiognomy. It's, it no longer has any kind of structure. It no longer, it's, it's lost a depth that, that it used to have. Another um, another feature of Schneider's psychic blindness is that he doesn't, or another another um, symptom, I guess, of of his injury or his disease, or however it came about, he doesn't do anything for fun. He's unable to do anything um, just for pure and the sake of pure enjoyment. So when he goes for a walk, he can't just go for a walk because it's a nice day. He goes for a walk if he has something to do, if he's got a place to go to. Um, so he's incapable of play. And that, and the central feature of play is that it's something done, um, or it's something done within an imaginary situation, within an imaginary context. And that, as we saw, is, is something that, that Schneider is no longer able to project for himself. So there's a unity underneath all of Schneider's disorders, all of his, his uh, these features of his, his, um, his condition. And that is that he's bound to the actual and has lost the concrete freedom of being able to place himself in a situation. He has, he's no, he, the, world, the, the world only has one sense for him. He's only able to grasp the world in one way. He's lost one of those holds over his body. He can only, he can only see his body as, um, 
as, as in a, an already given context, in, in an actual situation. So he's just, he's lost that, that, like I say, that concrete freedom of being able to project a situation for himself. And Malopondi calls this freedom a vector moving in every direction like a searchlight. So it's the the freedom that we have is that we're able to to kind of scan around us and project intentions out there, um, even if they're not real, even if they're not demanded by the situation. We're able to 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 operate in this way to understand our body and our relation to the world in this this um, virtual manner but of course he said that's the analogy he gives but he does point out that analogy is deficient because the search the searchlight analogy presupposes that objects are already out there and we're just finding them that's never the case like i said before the the, the world the objects around us are never neutral in value they're never valueless they're always imbued with with meaning as soon as we're aware of them um, so he calls this vector this vector moving in every direction um, giving meaning bestowing meaning on things the intentional arc and this intentional arc projects around us our past our future our human milieu our physical situation, etc. Everything. That's where. Um, that's what creates the background on which every movement is, in which every movement takes place. And so this is the unity that we were looking for underneath Schneider's disorders. It's the unity underneath our disparate senses. We have different ways of, of sensing different sensory apparatus, but they all come together in this intentional arc. And it's also the unity underneath sense and intelligence, the receiving of, of sensory data and the, the intelligence, the putting, putting it together, the analytical side. That's the unity. It's this intentional arc. It's the unity between sensitivity and motricity, between feeling things and moving towards them and moving um, in relation to them that it's this intentional arc creates these this background on which all of our, our actions and our understandings of our body take place uh, and so this ties in with what we talked about earlier as the body schema as dynamic as a posture towards the world um, because that's where this intentional arc comes from, comes through this body. And that is, I've already kind of given the, uh, revealed the the uh, the ending, given the ending here. That, that's the next section I want to look at. What is, what is the body? What's the role of the body in this intentional arc? And the body's role centers around motricity, this idea of motricity, movement. Um, and Meloponte calls it, calls motricity, the original intentionality. So it's, it's um, movement and action is not something ancillary or something that comes after um, our thought, our intentions. It is the, the first intention that movement is genuine original intentionality that gesture gesturing to your friend that's it's not it's not something that happens after you've you've thought about gesturing to your friend it is the the gesturing to your friend sorry it is the thought the gesturing is the thought it, it's it's contained within that that's where intentionality lies in that motricity in that action and, and Malopondi gives a nice um, expression of this. He says, consciousness is not an I think that, rather it's an I can. 
And that is awesome, I think. That's, again, this different way of thinking about consciousness, not as a detached observer manipulating a, an object, our bodies, but as, as this, this engaged, embodied um, process. The, the, it's, consciousness is the action itself. Consciousness isn't I think that, but it's an I can. That's a really important, important realization, I think, there. So consciousness is a being toward the thing through the body. Or and another nice expression, it's a responding to the solicitation of the thing. Remember we talked about the um, Schneider's tools as being poles of action. Is that how we describe them? I think so. Poles of action. Yeah. Poles of action. They 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 solicit our intention they solicit our movement and and um again it's just this this more <clears throat> inclusive kind of holistic way of understanding our existence our, our being in the world um okay uh and one way we can see this <clears throat> the importance of action and and as Milo Ponte calls it, motricity, is the way that a movement is never or is only learned once a bot once the body has understood it. So you don't you can't learn how to do something, how to perform a movement. Um, for example, play the drums. You can't learn how to play the drums by reading all the books about drumming that have ever been written, by analyzing um Everything there is to analyze about drumming, knowing the the how hard to to hit the drum, knowing how high to raise the drumsticks, um, knowing you know at what point you have to hit each drum to get to to play a certain song. You can't analyze that and then go sit down at a drum set, drum kit, is that what they call it, the drum kit, and then and then play. It just won't happen. You won't be able to do it. There's more to it than that. You have to. The body has to understand it, not the mind. It's not. It's not something you can just analyze and then master. It's something you have to. You have to get into. You have to throw your body into it, and and your body learns it, not your not your brain as such, not your mind. Um, <clears throat> so that's cool. The, the result of this, the consequence of this, or one consequence of this, is that the body cannot be in itself, which means it can't be a thing. It can't be an object. Again, I mean, I, I ranted about this in the last video, I think, but don't, don't confuse this with a criticism of Sartre. That's not, even though we're, we're using um, language usually associated with Sartre, um, <clears throat> it's, not, it's not a thing. So it's not in space or time like an object in a container. Um, rather, Malo Ponti says it inhabits space and time, which is a nice way of thinking about it. It's enmeshed within space and time. Um, so we can't reduce it to a thing, the status of a thing. And one a nice way of thinking about this is that the body for example, is, is always here and now, right? It's, it's always in a way that you could argue our minds are not, you know, I can think about anywhere, any place, I can think about any time. So my mind is kind of free to roam, but my body is always trapped here in the, in the present, right? <clears throat> and, and, and wherever it is that I am in my current location, but that, that's, that's actually an oversimplification because if you think about it, the body, the preceding instant, the, or all of my preceding instants are carried in my body. They're with, with me in my body. Again, playing the drums is a good example because all of that time that I spent playing the drums, I don't know why, I, actually I can't play the drums, so I don't know why that's my example, but um, all that time you've spent playing the drums it's not it's not it's not a, it's not a mental thing it's not it hasn't 
it's not something retained in your mind. Your body retains the knowledge too. So you carry that skill with you through your body. And and you can, um, that's obviously not, that's not the only type of example, acquiring skills. Your body, your, your body has um, traces of, of everything that's happened to you in the past. And moreover, it, it anticipates the future as well. So it, it's not as, as trapped as we might think. In the sense, if you're catching a ball, you know, you, when you, you're moving around, you, you're judging where the ball is going to land or where the ball is going to um, pass by in order to catch it, you're not, um, <clears throat> it's not, it's not a purely mental process. You're not analyzing, you're not calculating vectors and angles and distances. You're, you're, you're feeling where the ball is going to go with your body. And, and in fact, if you, if you stop doing that and you try to analyze it, if you try to think about it, to, if you try to direct, consciously direct your body, you'll end up missing the ball. It's only when you kind of let go let your body take over. Um, that's when, that's when you're able to, to to do these kind of things successfully. So the body's not quite as as um, as um, stuck, fixed as it might appear. <clears throat> um, and this tells us then that this explains how the body understands the world without representations or concepts. It's, 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 it's connected to the world. So the body schema isn't of my body, but it's of my body in the world. So it's related to, it's connected to the world um, in a more fundamental and intimate way than we usually allow, than we usually consider. It's not this, it's not an object you know, subjective to, or subject to um, objective considerations. It's not an object. We don't plot it out with coordinates. The relationship is more immediate to the world than that. Um, and that's why it's, it's connected with motricity, movement, gestures, that's, because that's, that's how we engage with the world. That's, that's the way that um, we are geared towards the world. That's another nice expression. And so this, um, Malo Ponti connects this idea with that of habit as well. Um, and you might remember we talked about the habitual body as opposed to the actual body um, a few videos back. And it's the same idea there, that this habit um, is is the way is is the is this way that we are connected the way that we are in, enmeshed in the world, um, and he talks about the the, uh, the cane of a blind person. So the blind person's cane, when they're they're moving it around to 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 see what's in front of them, to pick up any any obstacles or obstructions, they don't. If they, if they encounter something, then it, it, it's not a, a calculation that happens next. They don't think, okay, well, I know the space from my arm to my hand is about 80 centimeters. And from my hand to the end of the cane, it's about a meter and a half. So the thing in front is then blah, blah, blah. That, that's not what happens. Not even at, at a subconscious level. That kind of, that level of processing just doesn't take place. That's not the way that we navigate. That's not the way that we interact with the world. So rather what happens for the, the, the blind individual is he has become habituated to the cane by trying it out, by getting a feel for it, by using it. That's, that's what gives him or her the, 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 the ability to sense the world around, around them through that cane. So there, there's no, you, again, just the idea that the, the connection we have with the world and ob, objects in it, it's, it's habit. 
not in the sense that it, it's um, unthinking, but in the sense that it, it's pre-thinking. It takes place before that. It, it's more natural. It's a more natural um, process than, 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 than thought. So I've got a, a quote here. To habituate oneself to a hat, an automobile, or a cane is to take up residence in them. Habit expresses the power we have of dilating our being in the world or of altering our existence through incorporating new instruments. So that's nice. That's, that's a good um, way to think about it. it, it um, again, more, more really nice phraseology, eh? Dilating our being in the world, taking up residence in things, in the things that we use and that, that surround us. Uh, he also talks about typing. And it's, again, the same idea that when the typist types, um, their, their intentions don't stop at their fingers. The keys, the keyboard becomes a part of their body space their body schema. It's not just, body schema is not limited to the body. It's it's what we use. It, it has this practical element to it. It's the way that we project ourselves towards our, our goals and, and the objects in the world that we're using to achieve those goals. So the keyboard becomes a part of the typist's bodily space. And just reinforcing that point, I think I touched on it before, habit is not knowledge or automatic reflex. So it's not intellectual, it's not analytical, but nor is it just um, just a, a, a kind of <clears throat> conditioned response. It's always attuned to the world in a particular way. It's always meaningful. Um, and it becomes meaningful by having by one taking up residence in the thing, by using the thing, getting a feel for the thing, um, and acquiring this practical understanding. And another quote, our body is the very movement of expression. It projects significations on the outside by giving them a place and sees to it that they begin to exist as things beneath our hands and before our eyes. The body is our general means of having a world. <clears throat> uh, again, just, a, just some more nice expressions, right? Um, the body is the movement of expression. It's, it's motricity is that intentionality. And I like this. The body is our general means of having a world. It's, it's the way that we have a world. It's the way that the world appears as a world before us. And habit is one mode of this power, one mode of this general means of having a world. And it's, it's, it's a fundamental one because it, it, um, it grounds us in the world. And it's that, it's through that, that type of becoming accustomed to becoming resident in things that that lets um, objects appear as things in space with an object of space that we can we can see so that the objective is built on top of this deeper um, more fundamental expression of of human existence and so this investigation into motricity has uncovered a new sense of the word sense. The word sense now doesn't mean perhaps what it used to mean, which was just um, receiving sensory impressions. Now it's the way that I'm going to use a, a Heidegger term here, um, even though Milo Ponti doesn't use it, but just because it seems to fit so well for me. Sense now means the way the body attunes us to the world, the way it, it, it places us within the world and, and lets us get a footing in the world, um, the way it grounds our being in the world. So that this 
idea of sense, then it's, it's uh, less tangible, again, more ambiguous. But it's, it's at, the, at the core, it's at the root of all of the, the less ambiguous things, the, the more objective and precise um, scientific descriptions and accounts of, of um, our body and the world. But it, 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 because of that, it's more important. It's more foundational. It's more, it's more primordial. Um, yeah, okay. So let's have a quick look at a summary. So first we looked at the body schema, which uh, we saw was not positional spatiality or proprioception, which is a very scientific, uh, objective way of, of approaching our awareness of our bodies. But it was a situational spatiality. So it, it's, it's fundamentally geared to the, towards the world. And that means it's dynamic. So it, it's caught up, it's bound up inextricably with this, what Merleau-Ponty calls motricity, action, gesture. Um, we looked at the intentional arc and the, the way that this gave us the concrete freedom to place ourselves in a situation. And this was, this was what Schneider had lost with his psychic blindness. He, he was no longer able to um, project a situation for himself and the intentional arc provides the unity underlying our experiences it brings the form that's what that's what creates the form of our um, body schema of our awareness of our body this intentional arc drives that <clears throat> and then we looked at the body and the body's role in the intentional arc and we saw that motricity is original intentionality and that nice phrase, um, consciousness is not I think about, but I can. Consciousness is fundamentally embodied. It's, it's a, a, a intentionality is originally action, movement, direction towards the world. And the body is our means of having a world. It's, it's that through which we have access to the world. It grounds our being. Um, and habit as one important mode of this, this power is a taking up residence in something. And, um, and as I said, it's the mode by which we have a world. Okay, so that is that one. This is quite a long one, I think. Um, but yeah, hopefully that has shed some light on something for you. I think I think we're we kind of, we are really discussing the same kinds of ideas quite a lot. The idea that you know, the body is is a phenomenal field. We really haven't said anything more about that. that that's still where we're at. The body, the phenomenal field. We're just just kind of fleshing out how um, the phenomenal field does what it does, and and the the centrality of the body. In that, so I think there is. We, 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 I feel like we are kind of circling the same idea, um, but it lets us flesh out a whole lot of different, um, or see see that same idea from a diff, a few different perspectives, and then get a, a, a more deeper, a deeper understanding of it. Hopefully, that's the plan. Anyway, okay. Anyway, thanks for listening, and I will catch you again in the next video.